So we have a number of uh, expert panelists who will join and, um, us today and who will introduce themselves, but I'll briefly say, my name is Devish Day. I'm uh, White and Case's Global Head of Islamic Finance. I'm a structured finance partner by trade, so I do a wide variety of products. I'm based in Dubai and spend a lot of time here in London. This is our eighth annual event. We're very pleased to keep it running. And, and the format, as usual, is that we'll put together a panel, and we're usually examining the topics of the day. And today's topics are LIBOR transition, which is an ongoing saga, but also, in addition, the effect on uh, Islamic structures uh, due to the implementation and interpretation of uh, IOP standard 59. The panelists today are Claire, my, my partners Claire and Anthony, um, and counsel Sean Jin, and our guest speaker Omar. And what I'll do is I'll hand over the mic to Claire to introduce herself. Thanks, Devashish. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm sorry I'm not in the room in London. I normally am for these things, but um, not this time, I'm afraid. So um, joining you from Dubai, where I'm based. Um, I've, I'm a partner in the debt finance practice of the firm. I've been um, in the region for a very long time now and looking at Islamic products for 15 or 16 years. So. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we're going to have a, a good, interesting, lively discussion today and um, look forward to hearing from you all in the questions. I'll pass over to Anthony. Good morning, everyone. And again, apologies, I'm not in the um, in, in, in the London office. My full intention was to be there, but the uh, district and circle line decided to stop running eastbound. So, mad dash, and I'm now sitting in my office at home, but I am a partner in the capital markets team in the uh, derivatives interest group uh, specializing in OTC derivatives. So I've been doing a lot of work um, on LIBOR transition related matters over the past couple of years and also um, have a South African and African background. So have been doing Islamic derivatives as, uh, as well. So to echo Claire, I hope and I anticipate a, a very lively discussion on the panel. Hey, so, uh, I'm, I'm Sean Jin, um, uh, Capital Markets Council. I'm, I'm based in Hong Kong um, usually, but I, I also spend uh, a lot of time in the Middle East having um, been in our Dubai offices since uh, well, I've been in the Middle East since 2010 and, and practicing Islamic finance and also sustainable finance since then. I'm very much looking forward to, to moderating this panel, and I'll hand over to Omar with that. Thank you, Sean. Uh, my name is uh, Omar Sheikh. I'm a director and board member of the UK Islamic Finance Council uh, and also the managing director of the Global Ethical Finance Initiative. I've been involved in Islamic finance for the last uh, 17 years, and um, Joining you from not as such an exotic location as Claire is, but from uh, Bonnie, Scotland, as you can probably tell, because I'm wearing a jumper in, in, in the middle of June. Thank you, Omar. Just a couple of housekeeping points. Um, that's interesting. I don't know why I've done that. Um, so just uh, just to know, we're recording the session today, um, and uh, questions can be submitted in the question box for those of you online. Um, I think, the, as I said to you, feel free to raise questions as we are running. Um, and in a minute, now that the screen is cleared, we're going to hand over to Omar to introduce uh, his topic in particular. So, Omar, over to you. Well, thank you much, uh, Devishish, and, and really, firstly, congratulations to all the White and Case team to be, this is the eighth year, I understand, uh, it's been running. So, I think that consistency really reflects a, a, a strong, deep commitment to the Islamic finance sector. So really well done to, to, to all of you there. Um, I was just going to kick off and just share a few thoughts uh, around the conversation around Islamic finance and the SDGs, that's the UN Sustainable Development Goals. In uh, 2020, following a good uh, you know, year or so of preparatory work, uh, the UK Islamic Finance Council launched the Global Islamic Finance and UN SDGs Task Force together with the UK government, the Treasury team, and the uh, Islamic Development Bank. Um, the, the context here at the time was we, we'd been doing a lot of work over the years prior to that uh, around Islamic and ethical finance. Uh, and there was 
there, there was a various issues within the market that we that we felt were important to address in a structured systematic way. Um, so we we set up this task force. It has four working groups. They are a disclosure and reporting working group, a um, education awareness working group, a Green Sukuk working group, of which White and Case are members, and a Pakistan working group. And I'll come back to these uh, in, in a few minutes as to what's involved with each one. But the context was very important as to why we set this up. Um, what we found was, of course, there was a global goals which had been set, and we had a target of 2030 to, to reach the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, for those who will remember, there were the Millennium Development Goals prior to that, and the SDGs had come out very much as the, the revised version, and was fast becoming the global kind of somewhat unified parameter for measuring uh, impact. So you would have seen in debt capital markets, HSBC is the world's first SDG bond. Soon after that, there was the SDG Sukuk as well. And Schroeder's and many other financial institutions are really beginning to use the SDGs as uh, many other private financial institutions, I, I should say, not just the development sector, using the SDGs as their primary parameter for measuring uh, impact. We were having a number of conversations, I'm sure, Devashish, you would have, you and your colleagues have seen this over the years. Is Islamic finance uh, really ethical or how ethical is Islamic finance or, or is it uh, assumed compliance? Is it whiter than white? Is it uh, already the most ethical form of finance out there and therefore the most sustainable form and so on and so forth? We were seeing huge global trends in the, in the, in the ESG space and the sustainability space. Um, we've been running one of the largest conferences in, in the space out of Edinburgh. And back in 2019, I felt we were at a point where you could no longer be seen to be doing nothing in the ESG and sustainable space. So that in itself was a massive movement. Um, and there was other ontological challenges and questions as well as, you know, do you get involved in this space because it's now commercially, sen you know, you know, sensible or interesting to do so? Or do you do it just because it's the right thing to do? And Islamic finance itself, you know, is, is it a follower or a leader as an industry? I remember. Uh, I used to be the former head of Islamic finance for EMY in London when I was working out in Bahrain. We used to have these conversations, uh, you know, is this small sector just following the trends or do we actually set any trends in the global financial services uh, arena? And that huge ongoing debate, um, asset based, asset backed, uh, halal or as we say in Arabic, um, that search for the soul of Islamic finance, um, you know, is it? Where do we move beyond the structured product to actually having a, a, a solid, identifiable social purpose uh, that's, uh, that's, that's shared across everyone across society? So that was some of the context within which we, we set up the, the task force. Um, we, we issued a number of reports at the task force um, over the course of the last 18 months. And I'll just share some of the key kind of findings of that in the next couple of minutes. Um, First of all, there's a five-part report series from 2020 across to 2022. First report was really framing the opportunity as to why should Islamic finance as an industry get involved with the SDGs. And that really identified kind of four key opportunities. Um, first of all, access to agnostic global liquidity pools, seeking ethical finance forms of deployment, tactical alignment with global multilateral development bank uh, funders, you have the IFC and many others who are shareholders of Islamic banks or have involvement there. So there's, there was a great uh, importance there. Um, enhancing the, the Makassid link and improving social relevance of the industry, Makassid being the spirit of the law, which goes to the essence of that debate between the spirit of the law and the letter of the law, and, and just generally moving in line with the global regulation and market trends. Um, the UN has reported there is a 2.4 trillion annual funding gap or economic opportunity, depending on how you wish to uh, uh, frame that, uh, to, in, towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, of which ISDB has um, estimated between 700 billion to a trillion, which is roughly 40% of that total gap is what applies to OIC member countries. We then went and had a look, well, actually, what is the current status of understanding and awareness of sustainability in its broadest sense across the OIC and across the Islamic finance industry. So we did 
We used two benchmarks for this and we did some interesting analysis. First was the UNPRI, which is the Principles of Responsible Investing, picked up by many asset owners and asset managers, been around for several years. Um, and we, we looked at the PRI signatories in our report in, in 2021. And we found whilst the Muslim population, you know, is around 24% of the global population, we found only 1% of the three and a half thousand plus PRI signatories at the time were from OIC countries. Now that's a shocking statistic. 1% of the global signatories were from OIC countries. Um, when we look at the PRB, um, which is the Principles of Responsible Banking, a newer initiative that's been set up by UNFI, we found 10% of the PRB signatories were from OIC countries. We then went further to analyze not just the geographical uh, basis, but we also looked, okay, at Islamic financial institutions and where they sit within this. Uh, and we found of the PRB, three of the 221 signatories were actually fully Sharia compliant and, and with a further six who had uh, Sharia compliant windows. Um, and we found 49 of the 57 OIC member states do not have any PRB signatories at all. So that's two interesting uh, benchmark by which you can look at the asset management world and at the banking world and see how they're engaging with global sustainability trends. The other reports uh, covered Sharia and the SDGs, uh, the team at ISRA in Malaysia uh, understood that particular report for us and they looked and found fundamentally that there were very few issues contradicting Sharia which are related to the definition, those were related generally to the definition of gender equality uh, but very few other than that actually, uh, and there's nothing that, do, that, that does not undermine the value proposition of the SDGs as a viable framework for sustainability. And there was a bit of narrative there around the role of Sharia scholars when we come to such issues, which is also uh, quite interesting as a critique. We, we were then uh, commissioned to do some work by UNDP Indonesia to look at the Green Sukuk uh, piece, which the uh, Indonesia was the first sovereign in the world to issue a, a Green Sukuk, which we know uh, Sean, I believe yourself and the team at White Case were also involved with, and that's a fantastic global benchmark uh, issuance there. They had both uh, the sovereign scoop and the sovereign retail scoop as well. And from that report, we unpack what's involved with issuing a green green scoop. You can find all of this on our website, ukic.com forward slash sdg. Uh, but from the detailed analysis there, we felt there was a 30 to 50 billion dollar opportunity over the next five to seven years in the space of green and sustainable Sukuk. And finally, the working group on disclosure and reporting issued also a, a report on um, uh, a report on PRB guidance report, which was looking at the self-assessment reporting requirement for banks signing up to the PRB. And they specifically put together a useful tool which will help Islamic banks looking to sign up to the PRB, which is something we've been encouraging for some time. Uh, just a couple of months ago, we launched uh, in Dubai at DIC with the governor of the state bank of Pakistan, the Pakistan sector SDGs and sustainability report, which was a very novel approach to sustainability where the whole banking sector has come together to look at this uh, uh, issue collectively. And we're conscious not a single bank within Pakistan, the fifth most populous country in the world, has signed up to um, the PRB. Again, as we see there in other jurisdictions like Nigeria, issues of climate might not be as important or they're, they're, they're understood as being critical, but in terms of the priority scales of other issues such as financial inclusion and other sustainable uh, factor issues are, are, are found to be more uh, preeminent. Um, so that's some of the work that we've done, um, uh, the relationship across our work, across the task force. It's, uh, it's, it's given some very useful parameters and some practical tools by which we can help engage and enhance the, the involvement of the SDGs across the global Islamic finance industry. Sean, I'll hand back uh, over to yourself. Thanks very much, Omar. That's, um, that's very, very insightful and, and we look forward to supporting um, you and, and these initiatives going forward as well. I think obviously SDGs, ESG is just one of um, one of many um developments or trends that we see in just global financial markets generally um 
we wish we had time to talk about all of that, um, but we've got a lot of ground to cover in the remainder of this session. So I'll move on to the to the other two um, um, points that um, or kind of trends that we wanted to, to discuss with our panelists now. Um, so just kind of setting the scene, I, I guess um, you know coming into the our, our eighth um, uh, webinar, um, having previously done one last year, I think how the year has turned out um, probably isn't what many of us would have expected. Um, what a what a first half it's been. Um, we've had um, just as the world is getting um, used to or trying to get back on track um, post pandemic um, and into recovery, we get faced with um, war in Europe, uh, rising gas prices, um, which can be both a benefit and a burden, of course, and then and interest rate heights as well. And then, of course, against this backdrop, which affects the Islamic finance industry as part of um, as a segment of the wider um, finance industry globally. Um, we've had certain notable um, industry level developments, uh, which are kind of, which are namely um, LIBOR transition and kind of the more stringent adoption and application of certain AOP standards across Islamic finance transactions. Um, now, these have been in the works for a, the last couple of years at least, and, and we've all seen this coming, but whilst even up towards the end of last year, um, the mood was somewhat um, kind of planning mode. Um, the proverbial rubber has now very much hit the road, and we are now collectively um, dealing with these developments um, on a real-world basis um, as we implement structure and execute transactions. So with that, I'll turn over to our panelists, and if I can start with Claire. Um, from the beginning of the year, this year, publication of most LIBOR settings have ended. So in your deals, how is LIBOR transition being catered for um, in terms of the, the products that you work with? Thanks, Sean. Um, I think I think we're in a really interesting position. And maybe if I can just for a second take a, a quick zip back to where we were, sort of this time last year when we were talking, just for some context. Um, so as, as you rightly said, you know, for the, the UK and US regulated financial institutions, they're no longer permitted to use LIBOR for new new funding lines um, from the first. Of January this year, and for those who aren't regulated by those um, jurisdictions at all, you know, LIBOR will um, cease to have um, rates published in June. So we really are in a position where LIBOR is not going to be something that we can rely on um, on a going forward basis. And I think we talked last year, and we talked even the year before about the relative um, apathy, perhaps I can use that strong term in terms of the, the discussion and the implementation of alternatives in the Islamic space specifically. And we were all getting very concerned about where we were actually going to end up on, on January 1. I, I think we, we have moved a little bit forward, but I still think we're very much in a state of flux, Sean. And I think when we look at the syndicated products and the, the, you know, the pure debt products in the space, there's quite a lot of different approaches being taken. There's certainly a lack of consistency. Um, and, I, and I think we're, we're going to struggle through that, that for a little while, um, certainly for the rest of this year. The, and maybe we can come on to this as we go through the, the, the various um, questions that we're going we're gonna to talk to. But there was an IAC conference last month, for example, and even in that, and, you know, we were all sat hoping, ready, waiting for the, you know, the magic answer as to what we were going to do with these various products. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't have that magic answer. I don't think we really expected it necessarily, but um, there was certainly a discussion about it. And I think that was really important that, that all the Victoria teams and the IAC are really concentrating on, on an implementation method. Um, and a, as I say, there's a couple of different routes being being looked at. I don't think we've got there yet, um, and, I, and I think that's that's still something that's concerning for um, speed of the sort of market deal going forward. Thanks, Claire. Could I, uh, Anthony? Um, do you have thoughts on the Islamic derivatives side? Thanks, Sean. Um, yes, I mean, just to echo what Claire was saying, I think a year ago, we, from an Islamic derivatives perspective, were very much in the, in the same boat, um, with not much conformity or certainty or any sort of clear, um, path forward in relation to, to LIBOR transition and, uh, on, on the, uh, in respect of Islamic derivatives. Um, 
that fortunately has changed, um, uh, I would say, fairly substantially because in December 2021, so just uh, in about six months ago, um, the is the IFFM uh, eyeball fallback and definitions booklet for Islamic um, hedging transactions, which a bit of a mouthful, so I'll just call that the definitions booklet, and a bilateral amendment agreement uh, was published by the IIFM. And what those two documents uh, do, um, so the amendment agreement effectively seeks to amend the uh, hedging transactions which are documented under Tuckwit Master Agreement, uh, which reference eyeball uh, benchmarks to incorporate the uh, uh, risk-free rates or RFR transition provisions uh, which are contained in the uh, in the definitions booklet. So, without going into too much granularity, how it how it works from a uh, Islamic derivatives front is um, so. In terms of the the definitions booklet, the uh, fallbacks will be triggered um, in the case of a so specifically looking at LIBOR on a non-representative uh, determination. So as soon as the, uh, uh, the, the particular LIBOR rate is non-representative, the fallbacks kick in. And the IBOR and, and specifically LIBOR fallbacks are based on alternative risk-free rates, uh, which will be term and spread adjusted to account for the difference between the IBOR and the, the, the risk-free rate. Um, the IFFM has designated Bloomberg as the vendor that will calculate and uh, publish the, the risk-free rate. And what Bloomberg will actually do, it will publish effectively what is called an all-in fallback rate. So that would uh, include um, any sort of credit spread adjustment which would need to be added to ensure that there's a smooth transition between the, uh, t between the eyeball um, and the uh, and the the, the risk-free rate, um, and that's generally the the, the sort of uh, standard which which has been taken in the non-Islamic derivatives uh, sphere as well. What is interesting in relation to um, the definitions booklet, and and I'll come on to this a, a little bit later on, is that it is largely based on the Supplement 70, so the ISDA Supplement 70 to the 2006 ISDA definitions. Um, so anyone who's done sort of non-Islamic derivatives work will, will recollect the, um, the, I suppose, slight headaches which come in relation to uh, risk-free rate transition on a, on a hedging basis versus uh, the pure sort of underlying financing trans uh, transactions, and that could potentially be a challenge um, from the Islamic derivative space. And then just to sort of, um, you know, end um, on sort of uh, how the fallback rates are actually going to be published um, in terms of the definitions booklet and what's actually envisaged. So effectively, each each fallback rate for a particular eyeball antenna that is published by Bloomberg will be linked to an original uh, eyeball rate record date. And if the fallback rate has not been published by Bloomberg two business days prior to the relevant payment date in terms of the uh, derivative transaction, then what the definitions booklet provides is that the fallback rate uh, for that eyeball antenna that is published by Bloomberg for the most recent original eyeball rate record date uh, will be used instead. So there's a fairly detailed and specific, um, I would say, waterfall set out in the definitions booklet in relation to, um, uh, you know, the, the, the transition exercise. Thanks, Anthony. It's, um, of course, uh, it's, it's promising to see that in one, one area of uh, of the industry, um, there has actually been some um, substantive progress in terms of standardization, finding solutions. Um, I think in, in the, the other two areas that we have, that Claire and Devajish represent, uh, and myself as well, there's been, as the Claire mentioned, significantly less 
um, kind of advancement in that and and some apathy as well. Um, I, I want to come back to Claire to talk about um, RFRs and because that's that's kind of the solution that's obviously been mooted on the in the conventional side, but it's not quite as straightforward to implement that for Islamic finance um, transactions. So Claire, if you could um, just uh, run us through kind of the, the the challenges or the proposed solutions that you've seen in the debt finance space. Thanks, Sean. Look, I, th I think we've got um, we've got the couple of options that are on the table that are in, also in the conventional space. One is term software. Let's talk in dollars because you know the vast majority of the of the market for Islamic finance we work in is dollars. So let's just use that for ease. Um, so if you're looking at term software, obviously that's a really really helpful RFR from an um, Islamic perspective. It looks and feels a lot like LIBOR in the way that it's. Um, in the way that it's actually documented as a look forward look forward rate. So actually, you know, the ability to have certainty and, and um, um, in advance of Murabaha profit periods or Ijara and rental periods is actually easily solved with term. The problem with term software, as I think everyone probably knows, is that actually we're not able to back that up on hedging at the moment particularly well. There isn't a very liquid um, derivatives market using term software. So actually when we're looking at these transactions, um, that nearly always have a side-by-side -side hedging component with them, that, that term software RFR actually isn't that helpful because you end up with this terrible mismatch in basis risk. So would we love to see term software being used more? Absolutely. I think there's there's a, actually a big demand for it when we're talking to treasury teams in the region, you know, they're all things being equal, they would rather use term software right now. Um, but again, we have this, this problem with hedging. So so at the moment, we're trying to look at, and, and the market is looking at how we can utilize the, the compounded in arrears um, software rate. And obviously, the problem with that, as everybody knows and we keep going on about, is this lack of certainty because it's um, it's a look back rate, which in a conventional loan is calculated when you get to the end of the interest period. From a Sharia compliance perspective, that doesn't work because as we enter into a Murabaha or into um, an Ijara rental period, we have to know what that profit element is and be able to calculate it up front. So there's a little bit of um, structuring that is, is, is happening around that. And I think look, the, the IFI conference reiterated that there was a couple of options being used now. I think we're we're all somewhat familiar with what's happening in the Murabaha because actually, and maybe we'll talk to this later, it's a similar approach that's being used for the, the step around on IAC 59 standards. And that involves having um, a long Murabaha and then spot um, Murabahas to, to kind of true up on your profit. Um, in Ajara, interestingly, you know, we've been seeing um, market participants struggling a little bit with with the Ajar. I think it's a more difficult product with your rental period to actually um, to calculate. A similar approach has been taken, but there's now two sort of divergent themes coming up on the Ajar. Um, and one is similar to what I was just saying on the Murabaha, where you have um, essentially, rather than having a long Murabaha contract and a spot all tied together, you have um, a break in your rental period. So you would go for a you know, rental period minus three days for, for one, and then you would have a three-day true-up almost, um, if I can call it that, um, for your Ajara rental period. And, and the manner in which that, that sits together, the documentation is a little bit tricky, and I think there's still a lot of discussion around that. The alternative is having an assumed rate or a rate where, and one of the things we've seen people use is using a previous um, block rates, but obviously that isn't necessarily going to be economically viable for financial institutions um, or even you know borrowers with big treasury streams where they're looking across multiple products. So I think that's still very much a work in progress in terms of how the compounding arrears software is being implemented, um, and certainly there is divergence of usage, and, and as ever there is um, divergence of opinion within Sharia boards, but. I think from the lawyer's perspective, there's a couple of options on the table that, that documentation is starting to work through. So we'll get there, but um, I think it would be it would be good if there was a bit more concentration from from everybody to try and find a market-driven solution. So that when we're in the syndication market, for example, um, 
or not having to have multiple, multiple tranches um, of transactions to accommodate everybody. Um, I don't think that's issues with the, whether you have similar experience on the on the bond side. Well, on the book side, Claire, I mean, we sidestep the issue slightly. Um, so, I mean, just for the people in the audience who aren't familiar with some of these products, the Marabaha is really a, an installment uh, payment uh, purchase price. So it's effectively a debt-like product where you uh, are managing to uh, repay your financing through a series of installments through an artificial purchase of commodities. And then for Ajara, it's a classic sale and leaseback. So cook transactions typically are a hybrid, so we have to use something alongside a Marabaha to keep the tangibility. So we, the most common structure is Najara. Now we sidestep a lot of the issues that Claire and Anthony have raised because we're mostly U.S. dollar and mostly been fixed income. So in a way, we're uh, kind of the, the kids sitting down the hall waiting for the grown-ups to sort it out on the banking and derivative side, and when they do, they can tell us how they do it. But the practical reality is we haven't needed to do a lot of it. That being said, I think the problem we have is that we have to adapt Islamic structures to the way we think of risk-free rates, and the two don't quite marry up. Ajara is a very good example. So if you think about it, Ajara is a sale and lease back, and in traditional way, particularly if I have a fixed income product, what I'm doing is I'm setting my rental, and I'm setting it at the beginning of a period, and I'm saying you owe me rent for this period of time, easily calculable, set at the beginning. And that actually happens to marry up to the profit rate payable on the sukuk, which is what the investors receive. If I'm working on a structure where I'm looking back, it seems odd because what I'm now telling you is your rent is going to be calculated at the end of the period. I'm going to tell you based on looking back what your rent should be which is not how most people think, and it's also not necessarily conducive to the way the documentation works. Now, we haven't had to deal with that. I know that on the a recent transaction that we did in Asia, which Sean and I worked on, for um, a period of time, the risk-free rate was contemplated in an Ajara structure, and in the end, we weren't able to resolve all the issues that arose, and so we didn't go with it. So I'd, I'd say at the moment, we're well behind in terms of what the solutions will be on the Sukuk side. Back to you, Sean. Thanks, Debashish. And, and I think just to, to echo that point on that on that recent transaction, um, ultimately it became a commercial practicality as well in that that particular issuer um, knew that whilst they had a essentially an Islamic MTN program, um, they were most most likely only ever going to issue fixed rate. Um, so there was not the practical necessity to rely on actually kind of specified documented RFR alternatives as opposed to um, the kind of um, bridging benchmark fallback provisions that we see in, in just bond documentation in general. Um, with that, Claire, you you alluded to um, the kind of the structural adaptations um, in, in documents uh, and, and, and in, in transactions rather. Um, that have started to kind of be, be accommodated or we've seen um, in, in various types of fi Islamic financing transactions to, to cater for AOFE standard 59 and broader um, application of AOFE principles. Um, how has, in, in, your, in your deals, how have these structures changed to cater for standard 59 and what broadly has been the impact um, from your perspective? Yeah, thanks, John. So we've been talking about standards 59 for a little while. Um, and just let's quickly summarise so everyone remembers standard 59 is, is one of the IOF standards um, around um, conceptually the, um, the sale of debt. Um, in a Marabaha context, um, the traditional approach in the syndicated debt market was to um, have a essentially revolving Marabaha where at uh, each interest, sorry, <laughs> profits period, um, reset date, the principal amount that had been drawn was refinanced using another Morabaha contract such that you, you basically deferred your, your, your principal payments down the line. So, and that was called a, you know, um, a subsequent Morabaha or take out Morabaha. And what happened with standard 59, is that ability to effectively refinance the principal with another Marabaha was um, 
was deemed to be not compliant. And the higher Sharia authority in the UAE actually adopted IOP 59 standards to say that actually the way that financial institutions in, in the UAE operate in in the Marabaha space is is not to be able to use that um, that sort of rollover Marabaha concept. Um, that caused a bit of consternation for the market because obviously you don't want to have a position um, where you have what is trying to be term debt having to be repaid and redrawn every three or six months. So obviously that that requires um, some structuring around it. And I think what we've seen is um, again similar to the way in which the, the sort of the LIBOR structuring happens. We saw a number of different strategies being thrown around by institutions and law firms, um, and we sort of probably boil down to one that is predominantly used and then a second which is occasionally used. Um, and actually, as I alluded to in, I think it was the first question, that that structure where you have um, two parallel more of her contracts, one which is for the term, um, for the principal rather, um, for a long period of time and a the margin, for example, um, and then the second contract which um, is there is an undertaking to enter into that second contract on a spot basis on the um, um, profit payment date, and that would be for the floating rate, which is calculated at that, at that point in time. Um, and that allows um, basically the, there's a long-term rubber contract and a spot contract, so that gets, gets around the problem of having um, a takeout. It also helps with the RFRs because you can recalculate uh, one day. So I think that's probably where we're going to actually try and solve for both. I think what is interesting in my space, and I, and I don't know how, how you guys in, in the other spaces are finding it, but it has created, this has created a sort of, um, uh, I guess, two-tier structure in, in the syndications is that those banks which have to follow um, the HSA and, and have to solve for standard 59 in the Rubberhead contract um are having to use this this sort of structured approach other institutions who aren't necessarily bound by that are still wanting to follow what we can call the traditional rubber her approach which we had for many years so we're actually seeing and i think it's not that helpful um sort of two trench transactions where it's purely structured for one that has to account for this and one that doesn't um and they're obviously doing that to enable sell down um, and syndication generally, but I, I don't think it's necessarily a helpful sort of progression of, of the syndicated market to have that two-tier structure. Thanks, Claire. Um, I think we've, we've had some questions in from the audience on, on potential structuring solutions as well, but we'll park that um, to the Q&A at the end um, in the interest of time for now. I think um, just moving on slightly, on. I mean, from my perspective, on the on the Sukuk side, actually, because most of the the U.S. Um, dollar international Sukuk that we do tend to be, for tangibility reasons, hybrid Sukuk, where you have a tangible component and the Marabaha component. Um, I think that the the the, the issue of standard 59 is some ways slightly less pronounced than on the on the pure banking side, um, given that the the profit rate, even if it's floating, can be um, a, adjusted to, to basically be funded from the tangible element of, of the hybrid structures. But broader um, broader structuring considerations and um, hurdles, let's say, um, have arisen um, or speed bumps in the road have arisen in, in transaction structuring and execution that we've seen over the last two years. And it seems to be arising more and more. And, and part of that is due to the application of um, of AOF principles um, kind of on a mandatory basis um, by um, certain um, regulators, including in particular the, the UAE HSA, which is part of the, United, uh, the UAE Central Bank. Devashish, if I could turn to you, why um, could you could you just discuss why um, it's so important, or uh, why UAE um, investors are important, this UAE consideration is important, it's one jurisdiction versus Kind of a global market. Um, so, but why? Why is this? Um, why are structures being um, structured to, to cater for the compliance of those requirements? Sure. Um, so, I think it's 
probably, again, context, because it depends on where you sit in the market. Um, so we have uh, a set of historical events. We had um, an effort by the UAE Central Bank to bring some standardization to Islamic structures. And the way they thought they would implement that is that they created within the UAE Central Bank a policy committee, which is called the Higher Sharia Authority, which is uh, really a panel of expert scholars who happen to sit within boards of a number of prominent UAE banks who are typical investors or structures in Islamic finance. So far, so good. And you would think, well, that's not that much different, say, than in Malaysia, where the central bank has a panel of expert scholars as well. But the challenge that I don't think anybody saw was as follows, which is, like a lot of policy committees, policy committees are policy committees removed from necessarily what happens when you implement the policy. So within that higher Sharia authority, what they effectively have said is that they will look at Islamic structures and typically implement their view on what they think from a policy point of view, whether something complies or doesn't comply. So far, so good. But the UAE Central Bank's directive said that no bank that is governed by the UAE Central Bank can invest in a sukuf unless a fatwa is issued that says that that sukuf is compliant with what the higher Sharia authority says. In other words, that's the approach to standardization. If that uh, policy committee says it's okay, then you as a UAE Central Bank can invest. Also, good, but very different than what we've seen traditionally, which is typically it would be an investor-driven um, idea, which is at an individual investor basis, could be a, a bank in the UAE, they would decide by themselves whether they felt something was compliant, and then they would invest or not invest. Now, they suddenly had a policy committee outside the bank saying, unless it, we say it's compliant, you can't invest. Okay, so you would think that that means it's geographically limited to the UAE. And by the way, this actually created a lot of drag on the transaction, maybe inadvertently, but what has happened is that historical structures that everybody's been repeating and using for some time have suddenly been re-examined and rethought of. And so the traditional way that Sean and I might do an ajara suddenly was re-examined because it was a hybrid structure, we had to sudden, suddenly get feedback and comments on all aspects of things that before we just assumed were approved. Okay, but again, why does it matter? Well, it matters because the UAE plays an outsized role in the Sukuk market internationally. The banks in the UAE are often large anchor investors in Sukuk, in global Sukuk. And the way the directive is being interpreted is that not only do you, unless you have a fatwa from the higher Sharia authority, not only can you not invest in the primary, the issue is also you can't invest in the secondary. So you can imagine that another country issues a cook, which never was reviewed by the higher Sharia authority, and it's in the primary market, and people want to sell down their positions, and then they approach syndicated desks of UAE investors, and they'll say, is this approved? And if it's not approved, they won't buy it, which has an impact on liquidity. Again, why does any of this matter? Well, it matters because if you're in another country, you're suddenly saying, well, wait, I have my own Sharia principles. I have my own structures. And you're now saying I have to cater for uh, a higher Sharia authority in another country. Fine, I think we've always taken the view that you cater for investors in other countries. Look, we, we're in the UK and we constantly think about what US investors might or might not want. But the issue is that you can typically talk directly with those investors. It's harder to talk to a policy committee who doesn't take input and doesn't have channels for input. And that has led to, I think, uh, not, not so much negative feedback, but a lot of uncertainty on issuance and I think a slowdown on the issuance of Sukuk. So it's not an economic issue, we've just seen Sukuk supply uh, slow down tremendously as this impact has happened. Again, back to you, Sean. Thanks, Debatrice. I just want to stay with you um, for a moment on that as well, which is just practically speaking, I mean, as, as lawyers um, that practice um, in the Islamic finance space, 
often what we're doing is we're trying to bridge um, a, 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 a divide uh, essentially between commercial requirements of commercial um, bottom line outcomes of what deals should look like from a just pure term sheet perspective um, and ensuring that how the, the, the legal, the documentary mechanics of it all still work notwithstanding the change that required to ensure that it's still legal, valid, binding, enforceable and provides investors or lenders with the right with the same level of recourse that they do expect notwithstanding again what's under the hood let's say um from just from a practical perspective can you give some examples of um structurally how um what new features we, we're seeing in transactions that also um are things that for instance rating agencies care about and look into as well because it's something that they hadn't seen before which arises out of um these um aof related requirements yeah so um, I was afraid you'd ask this question. Uh, so so I, I'm struggling a little bit to try and come up with the analogy, but the analogy would be as follows. So you know in conventional finance, we also have green bonds. And at the moment, what we haven't been doing is saying that it's an event of default because something which we thought was green doesn't become green. Now, I, look, the FT's got tons of press about whether we've got greenwashing or not. But broadly speaking, if you buy a green bond, you're buying on the basis that it was compliant. There was a third party opinion. We could call that a fatwa. Um, and uh, there's a use of proceeds concept. And if in the middle of that, we find out that something wasn't compliant or more importantly, ceases to be compliant because we have moving standards, right? So one day we thought, BP was okay the next day, or better yet, we thought Tesla was green, and now we find out it's not green. So we um, would not have an event of default. What would happen is an investor would look at their portfolio and say, I don't like this anymore, I'll sell it. But the credit quality that's still fine. This problem is uh, much more acute, though, in Islamic finance, because the scholars are saying something different. So in conventional finance and in a conventional bond, just remember that approach. In Islamic finance, what Standard 59 was getting at was the trading of debt. What essentially it doesn't want you to do is it doesn't want to trade debt. What it's, it's effectively saying, remember, debt uh, trading at a profit is not something you're supposed to do in Islamic finance, so you can trade at par. But if an instrument evolves from being what was a sukuk into something that's interpreted as no longer an equity-type beneficial interest, but a debt instrument, the scholars want a punitive event to happen. How can that happen? Again, apologies, just bear with me. I'm trying my best. Um, we have hybrid structures. Our hybrid structures mean that we marry a marabaha together with a tangible structure like in a jar. So a sukuk is typically two things behind it. It will have a marabaha component, which is debt, and Claire is explain the complexity around that. And then typically tied into that is the majority of the sukuk will rep be represented by an ijara or something similar, which is a tangible, equitable-like property interest, which means that when you look at the sukuk as a total, over 50% of it is tangible or equity or property. So from a perspective of trading, we're not trading debt. In the secondary market, on the listing, on the stock exchange, you're not trading debt. You're trading Something like that's like a property interest, and that's why we're comfortable that it complies with standard 59. But the scholars, in their wisdom, ask the obvious. Well, what if the tangibility changes? What if the ratio of marabaha to, let's say, ajara changes from less than 50%? So it's equivalent to saying, what if it stops being green? Well, they have said in their standards, they want an event of default. Now, keep in mind, this is not a credit problem all of a sudden, but they are coming from the point of view, which is you shouldn't trade debt. So we need to say to the issuer, we need to stop trading debt because you've just created something that is not compliant with standard 59. It could happen in the middle of the deal, but it's happened. So we want events to happen. And one of the most catastrophic events would be, well, to stop the trading, we'll delist it. And so in some of the sukuk now, they ask as an event of default in, if you breach the standard, you have to delist the sukuk. So people like Sean and I said, well, if you delist, that, that affects some investors. So uh, we think that's bad. 
what we didn't realize is the scholars would say, mm, okay, if it's bad, then you need to force repayment. So you can imagine an issuer saying, well, wait a second, so the whole instrument just became due? For what reason? I haven't done anything wrong. Well, you didn't manage your tangibility, so you delisted. And so because you delisted, people like Sean and Debashish are saying that's bad, so you should repay it all. Um, and you should accelerate it. And this has been the debate that's been going on. And you can imagine a rating agency will look at two parallel instruments and say, if it was conventional, it would not be forced to repay. But if it's Islamic, it would. And you can imagine the stress or the pressure that that puts on a treasury. Um, and a lot of this is hidden away in the fine text. And people are agreeing to it because they need to get their deals done. Um, and we're all assuming that tangibility isn't measured anyway. But we're all lawyers. We look at the pages and we wonder how we're supposed to comply. So it, it's an interesting conundrum. And I, I, I don't think most people have been reading the text. It's sitting in the perspectives. Of, back to you, Sean. I think um, just conscious of time, I think I, I'd like to wrap up um, the discussion, which I hope has been very uh, has been insightful for the audience. Um, just open open really a question to the panel, which kind of um, dovetails off the back of everything that, that um, you've all been saying, which is um, also bearing in mind the context that we have um, on the line um, and in the room representatives from you know, various jurisdictions around the world. And as we all know, there are different applications of Sharia standards and different structures that are deployed depending on where the critical mass of investor or stakeholder kind of consensus lies. Now, with that in mind, um, one of the common the themes that has been going for Islamic finance and also sustainable finance for, for a long time now is standardization. Um, now, standardization, there may never be a one size fits all in both sustainable or Islamic finance, but um, we have seen, for instance, um, on the um, on the derivative side, there is growing standardization um, and different stages of, of advancement. Now, looking forward and just being a little bit more um, optimistic, I guess, um, at what the future may hold, um, where do you respectively see, and this is open to kind of all panelists, where do you respectively see the market going in your in, in the various asset classes that touch Islamic finance in terms of standardization, and conversely, do you potentially see, because of these structuring um, considerations that Debashish has just mentioned, for instance, actually, and because of the different treatment and different jurisdictions, there could actually be, rather than standardization, kind of segmentation or divergence in structures and, and maybe stagnation of deal flow? So, um, broad question, but I, I'll, let's close on that and I'll open up to the floor. Who goes first? Can I take that first? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that was going to happen, wasn't it? Um, so I, I, I think it's a really interesting point because we were, you know, until a couple of years ago when 59, um, uh, standard 59 sort of impacted the UAE market. Up until that point, there really was this sort of move and drive and feel that we were going to get to a standardized position. Um, and certainly from sort of documentation perspective, that seems to be happening. It feels like in the last couple of years, with the live ball transition and the like, 69 impact, um, we have completely segmented the market again. Um, and I, I'm really unclear actually as to how and where we go next. I, I suspect that on the live ball um, transition and the RFR position, um, we will end up fairly quickly um, in a position that everybody's happy with, because really that has to happen. Um, um, for a syndicated product to work. Um, so I, and I think IAC has, you know, from the conference last month, has given a couple of options and I, you know, I, I do feel like over the next six months, I mean, that's a bit optimistic, but let's say six months, um, we're going to get to a position which is frequently used by the majority of participants, regardless of their jurisdiction. Um, I think this point on the Marambaha and the 59 it still feels like it's segmenting the market. And I, you know, I've got a deal that's just started where I've been asked to draft a two transfer upper. And it's interesting that those participants that feel comfortable in the traditional Marabaha space just aren't wanting to get on board with the, the revised 59 structure because obviously they could do that too. Um, so I think that's interesting and that feels like it's not moving very quickly anytime soon. So, I, I fear from my space, it will be 
a bit of both. There'll be a, a bit of standardization on the on the risk rate, rates, um, hopefully, and then perhaps the market will st still segment on jurisdiction um, structurally. Actually, I, um, Sean, I've got a question from the audience, which was an interesting one, and I, I think it really goes back to the Murabaha approach that they're using in Malaysia, which is, and it was, it was a question that said, look, aside from what we've said about GCC scholars' preferences, what challenges do we see um, if we adapted something that Malaysia does, which is a ceiling profit rate with a compulsory uh, EBRA, which is a, a rebate, to be given by the issuer or seller? That would be your adjustment if you're looking backwards. So I, what do you think, Claire? Could we adapt that? That, yeah, I can take that. We've looked at that, and that is one of one of the solutions that has been tabled on the Murabaha. I think the the concern that's been sort of raised in the GCC, and this is where you know the the Shure kind of um, approach differs between Malaysia and the GCC, is is around that rebate. Because in Malaysia, they're a bit more comfortable with that being compulsory. In the GCC, they're not comfortable with that being compulsory. So it's still very much documented as optionality, even though commercially it may be agreed that it's, it will happen. But then the other thing that we've heard um, sort of on the grapevine from a couple of the banks is that when they, the Sharia might be happy with that structure, but actually when they've tabled that internally, their accountancy teams aren't very happy that actually there is a top line rate that they expect as their income or return from, from the, um, the, the product. And actually it's effectively being seen as a write down um, when when the rebate happens. And whilst we, we know that's not what's happening because there was a commercial intention, um, I understand that I'm not an accountant, so please don't everyone start typing manically that I'm wrong. Um, I understand that at least it was tabled as a concern that there might be an accountancy treatment or or certainly a reporting treatment into central banks that was going to cause a problem with that. So, and I, I haven't seen that adopted um, particularly regularly. And um, we have seen it, but not very regularly. I've got a question for Anthony from the audience, which is, um, you know, in terms of sustainability linked. So this is not use of proceeds, but this is effectively where we're linking the profit rate to a sustainable target or KPI or measure. We haven't seen this in a lot of products. What, Anthony, do you think we'll see this in the Islamic derivative space um, sooner than we might see it in some of the other product spaces like banking or uh, Sukup? Um, I would hope that, that, that we would. So certainly in, in the non-Islamic um, derivative space, the, the um, sort of sustainability linked derivatives or SLDs are really gaining traction. So we've seen, we, you know, we've seen a number of SLDs in, um, in Europe and the UK and, and the US and, uh, you know, gaining traction in Africa as well. And there's nothing magic about it. It, it really is a conventional, um, uh, derivative instrument, which, as you mentioned, Debashish, has certain KPIs or key performance indicators embedded into the instrument and whether or not a party uh, meets those KPIs uh, would, you know, have a, a positive or negative um, uh, implication from a cash flow perspective. Now, I suppose looking at it from an Islamic derivatives perspective, you know, we, what we would need to consider is firstly, is there enough certainty being included in the, in the KPIs so that a party knows from the outset and it is very clear in the contract, um, you know, if, uh, when a step up in payment or step down in payment obligations is going to occur. And, you know, if there, if a party doesn't meet its KPI um, requirements, uh, and that is effectively when there would be a step up in payment, um, is that considered to be some sort of penalty which would um, be contrary to Sharia law principles. So I think there are a few things to consider. Um, you know, we've had discussions with ISDA uh, exactly on this topic, and um, what ISDA have told us is that, you know, they are discussing um, sustainability linked derivatives with the IIFM um, to see if some sort of consensus can be reached. But I think, you know, 
as mentioned, the IFFM has been very concerned in relation to LIBOR transition, so it's been put a little bit on the back burner. But now that we have the definitions booklet, I'm hopeful that we can make good strides on, on the sustainability-linked derivatives for Islamic derivatives. Thanks, Anthony. I think I'm just conscious we're running out of time and people probably still have to get to work. So um, I just wanted to say thank you to all the panelists and to Omar as our guest speaker, and also thank you for everybody's patience online and in the room. Hopefully uh, you've all found it interesting. We'll try and keep these topical as we run from year to year. And apologies for all our jargon. Sometimes we forget that not everybody uh, is familiar with the products. But to everybody, Claire, um, Anthony, uh, Sean for moderating, thanks very much. And I uh, hope to see you again next year. Cheers.